I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. USS Mount Vernon, ID 4508. This troop ship has an absolutely incredible history during its service in World War I. The highly trained and highly disciplined crew of this ship ensured its survival through daunting adversity, both man-made and natural. In 1906, the German Neudeutscher Lloyd Line launched the transatlantic passenger steamer SS Kronprinzessin Cecily. The ship was named for Duchess Cecily of Mecklenburg-Schwerin, the last crown princess of Germany and Prussia, who just happened to be the daughter-in-law of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The ship was 215 feet long, 22 feet of beam, and displaced 19,400 tons. The ship had been crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. headed for Germany in 1914 when war broke out. Since the ship was carrying a large cargo of gold, and they feared that the ship would be seized by the British Royal Navy, the captain thought it'd be best to return back to the United States, which was, at that point in the war, still neutral. When the U.S. entered the war in 1917, U.S. Marshals seized the ship and turned it over to the Navy. The Navy converted some of the various spaces there to house passengers and added four or five inch guns, two one pounder guns, and two machine guns, as well as depth charges. The ship was commissioned 29 September, originally under its German name, but then it was renamed USS Mount Vernon. There's actually a photo of several sailors and their cap ribbons read a little bit different. Two are from USS New York. One says USS Mount Vernon. The other says USS KP Cecily. In its new life, USS Mount Vernon would begin its mission as a troop transport. World War I became the bloodiest conflict the world had ever seen. And the introduction of deadly weapons turned this warfare into just complete butchery. Machine guns, airplanes dropping bombs, submarines, and the absolutely evil phosgene and mustard poison gases killed virtually an entire generation of men in Europe. One thing that's often overlooked in this period of history is that something consumed countless more lives than this deadly warfare. The influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. As the United States mobilized to join the war, training camps were set up across the country. In spring of 1918, widespread cases of flu were noticed in these camps, as well as in the population at large. Unlike other waves of flu in the past, this began killing serious amounts of people. And it was not like typical kinds of flu in the past. This strain of H1N1 virus, the so-called bird flu, didn't seek out the typical populations that the flu tends to hit, the very young, the very old. This hit hardest on people in the prime of their life, young adults. It's been estimated that about 500 million people, a third of the world's population, became infected with the virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with about 675,000 deaths in the United States alone. 26% of the U.S. Army, more than 1 million men, were infected, and almost 30,000 of them died before they even got to Europe. Of the Navy's 600,000 sailors, 106,000 were hospitalized, and 5,027 died. Navy transports 
troop ships would ultimately take two million soldiers, marines, and sailors to France to join the fight. But cramming five or six thousand of these people into a ship, including many who were ill with the flu that they'd gotten in the training camps, turned into a nightmare. Many transport ships would arrive at port in Brest, France, with stacks of caskets on their main decks of those who died on the way across the Atlantic. Guidance that came out from the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery from the Navy Surgeon General said, here's some things to do to try to keep yourself healthy, you and those around you. Wash your hands frequently. Cover your mouth with a handkerchief. If you're sick, stay at home. Keep away from others as much as possible when you have a cough. And don't spray others with the secretions from your nose and throat in coughing, sneezing, laughing, or talking. Something sounds familiar about all this. This is the uniform of Pharmacist Mate First Class R.G. Osterheld of USS Mount Vernon. As you can see from his overseas chevrons, he spent enough time in service to be credited with two tours. As part of the ship's medical department, he had to care for seriously ill personnel on the way to Europe and horribly wounded personnel on the way back to the United States. In late summer 1918, USS Mount Vernon began the first leg of its ninth voyage. Starting in New York on August 24th, they crammed 4,900 soldiers into the ship and got underway for France. They traveled in convoy with other ships with destroyer escorts, as they always did, and arrived in Brest on September 3rd. In a quick turnaround, the next day they got underway back to the U.S. They were bringing home some wounded personnel and a hundred soldiers who'd come across to France with them but had developed flu and so they never went ashore. The following morning, September 5th, just before 0800, right around the time that the watch was being relieved, an alert lookout spotted a submarine periscope and reported it. Mount Vernon took immediate evasive action and trained its guns and depth charges on the U-boat, keeping its head down, but not before the sub could fire a torpedo at the transport. The officer of the deck had turned the rudder hard in an attempt to turn the ship so that the torpedo would miss it, but it was too late. The torpedo struck Mount Vernon amidships. The damage it took out half of its boilers, and put a huge hole in the ship's side. 35 sailors were killed and two later died of their wounds. 11 others were wounded and all these personnel, all the casualties were from engineering. In addition to treating the casualties, Petty Officer Osterheld and his fellow hospital corpsman had to move them into the lifeboats in case the ship ended up going down and they had to abandon its ship. Rapidly, they moved 153 personnel into the lifeboats. Fortunate for USS Mount Vernon was the fact that its crew was well-trained and highly professional. Quick action on the part of many personnel literally saved the ship. Fast and accurate action by the gun crew put some rounds right near where the submarine was, and the immediate firing of depth charges made sure that the U-boat, which was U-82, could not fire a second torpedo. The key to keeping the ship alive, though, was damage control. The most significant action was taken by Chief Water Tender, what you would now call a Chief Machinist Mate, Charles O'Connor. He was knocked to the deck when one of the boilers exploded. He was badly burned. He was stunned. But he had the presence of mind to be able to secure the watertight hatch to the space to ensure that no flooding would extend further than that particular area. For his actions, Chief O'Connor was awarded the Medal of Honor. 
Several years later, he was given an additional honor. He and seven other Medal of Honor recipients, himself, another Navy chief, a Marine, and five soldiers, were chosen to be the body bearers of the unknown soldier as they carried him to his tomb in Arlington National Cemetery. USS Mount Vernon at this time, just after the attack, was about 200 miles away from Brest. Despite its damage, the ship was able to turn around and safely make it back into port. The crew took pride in their distinction of being the only Navy ship in any Navy in World War I to be torpedoed and to be able to make it back to port on its own power without the help of any other ship. In Brest, USS Mount Vernon immediately went into dry dock. Here, Petty Officer Osterheld, the other hospital corpsmen and the medical officers of the medical department went into the damaged compartments searching vigilantly for the dead. They retrieved all of them and they were able to identify all of them. Mount Vernon reached out to the other U.S. Navy ships in port at the time and asked to borrow as many American flags as they could to cover the remains of their lost shipmates. After rendering honors in a memorial service, they transferred their fallen comrades to USS Leviathan, which took them home for the last time. After repairs in the dry dock in Brest, Mount Vernon got underway in late October, headed for Boston. Just two weeks later, the armistice was signed and the hostilities ceased. The jubilant crew marched in a parade in Boston and crew members put together a grand ball in a swanky Boston hotel. And this is the program from that that belonged to Petty Officer Osterheld. Between October 1917 and November 1918, the ship cruised 60,000 miles in 18 crossings of the U-boat infested Atlantic Ocean. During these crossings, they transported 35,000 soldiers to join the war in France. Even though the armistice had come, there was still work to do. USS Mount Vernon would cruise an additional 25,000 miles in eight crossings of the Atlantic. During these trips, they brought 25,000 American doughboys home to the United States. In each of these crossings, Petty Officer Osterheld and the rest of his fellow hospital corpsmen in the medical department had to remain vigilant. Even though it was on the wane, the present influenza pandemic was still going on. So they still had work to do. They got patients on every single crossing. In 1919, USS Mount Vernon was decommissioned and it was given to the Army Transport Service. The Army used it for less than a year. And afterward, it basically went into mothballs. By the time of World War II, the ship was old, it was tired, and it couldn't be brought up to snuff to be able to be useful, so in 1940, it was scrapped. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.